Good morning and happy Sabbath, everyone. What a wonderful day. I love the sunshine today. What about you guys? And I noticed that the weather has, that the temperature has come down a little bit, so I can breathe better. And it's so good to see Virginia. We missed you for the last three weeks. I'm so glad to see uh, Virginia today with us. And I, I also want to welcome everyone who's joining our service this morning, as well as those of who are joining online as well. I pray that, like uh, Sam uh, prayed for me, uh, may God uh, talk through me so that it, it is not really me uh, being up here, but it, it is the Holy Spirit speaking to all of us. Today, the, the title of my message is this, Learning to Receive, Cultivating a Heart of Gratitude. As you all uh, would, would know that I am not, uh, I wasn't born and raised in this country. No, yes. <laughs> so I was born and raised in Korea. So when I first came to this country in 2007, of course, there were many uh, cultural differences that I had to learn and, and, and hurdles that, ha- that I had to go over. But one thing that really kind of like uh, made me like, not uncomfortable, but I feel like I'm losing more money is this culture that we call tipping culture. Because, by the way, how many of you have been to South Korea? Raise your hand. Only one, two, three, so none of you, I mean, only a few of you, four back there. So how many of you are planning on visiting Korea? You better raise your hand. <laughs> Maybe 20 years, yeah, all, you, all of you. <laughs> but when you are, uh, if you're going to South Korea, Notice this. In South Korea, tipping is not customary. If you insist on leaving a tip, this may be seen as rude and can cause acute embarrassment even if you think someone should be rewarded extra for their work. Instead, thank your host politely and be respectful. If you go to Japan, (coughs) similar. It is in the Japanese culture to take pride in your work as such employees have the highest standards when supplying a service and don't feel the need to accept tips to feel appreciated. To the Japanese, attempting to give a tip suggests their employer does not value them enough to offer sufficient pay. But I'm, you know, when I'm here, okay, you know, when you're in Rome, you follow the, the, the rules in Rome. And so 2007, I was instructed to pay 10% for your lunch and maybe 15% for your dinner. But then now we're in 2022. How much tip do you pay? And I came across this article. Is tipping getting out of hand? of Americans say tipping culture is out of control as some businesses agree to scrap tip prompt. So two-thirds of Americans have a negative view about tipping, according to a recent report by Bankrate, particularly when it comes to a contactless and digital payment uh, prompt with uh, uh, predetermined options that can range between 15 and 35% for each transaction. And 30% said tipping culture has gotten, gotten out of uh, the control. And, and, and I, I got the curious. What's the history of the tipping culture? What does TIP stand for? Any of you know that? Yes, the history of tipping is this. One of the most widely accepted reasons behind the word tip comes from the phrase to ensure promptness. This phrase was found on the sides of bowls in coffee houses where uh, patrons could leave some money to ask for prompt service. So what does it tell you? Tip, the tip is not something that the server's were uh, entitled to. It was more like a reward for their extra effort and service, kind of like an express lane in a Disneyland. So as I'm reading the book of Exodus, something really stands out to me. 
it seems like the Israelites are starting to take all the guidance and protection that God is, was giving them for granted. It's like they're not fully appreciating the incredible support they are receiving. And it's making me think about how easy it can be to overlook the blessings in our own lives as well why we are going through our own journey to heaven. So now we're going to cover the Exodus uh, chapter 16. And in this chapter, God is training the Israelites to, 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 to grow their faith and, and not being entitled to what they are getting from God, but being appreciative. Because today, I think we are living in a culture that everybody's kind of entitled, right? So like, we take everything for granted, especially living in America, that you have bottomless supply in this country. Let's do a quick review. What happened in Acts 15? What happened? The previous chapter. Anybody remember? In Exodus chapter 15, that's when they, right after they crossed the Red Sea, when they were chased by the Egyptian army, they were all nervous and they thought they were going to get all captured and they're going to go back to Egypt again. And they saw this incredible miracle that the sea got split up and they walked on this dry land. And then what happened? The old Egyptian army got buried under uh, the, uh, the water. So they were praising God and everything. And, and all that, the gratefulness, how long did it last? Anybody remember? Three days. Why? Because they didn't have enough water. So they got to this point called Mara. They found the water. But what happened? The water was bitter. So they were complaining again. So what, what did uh, Moses do? He cast a tree into the water, and the water became very sweet. And then they went one day trip. Just one more day, and they arrived to a place called Elim, and they found plenty of water. So many palm trees there. It gave us a lesson that if you waited just one more day, you would have Witness the blessings from God without complaining. Are you following? So now, chapter 16, we are here. And they journeyed from Elim, and all the congregation of the children of Israel came to the wilderness of Sin, which is between Elim and Sinai. And the 15th day of the second month after they departed from the land of Egypt. So on the map, so Elim is here. Now they are here, right here. So that's the story. That's the place that this story uh, is taking place. Verse 2. Then the whole congregation of the children of Israel complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. Now they're complaining again. They just uh, had this plenty of water, but while they're traveling, now they're facing another challenge. What is it? And the children of Israel said to them, Oh, that we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the pots of meat, and when we ate bread to the full, for you have brought us out, out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. So the water was the problem. Now, what is the problem? Food is the problem. What are they missing right now? The meat. <laughs> we're eating meat in Egypt. <laughs> and we're eating all the sourdough white bread <laughs> in Egypt. <laughs> now you're going to kill us because we're hungry. And I, I try to really put myself into their shoes. And yeah, they're not really complaining about nice cars or, you know, mansion or anything. It's like a food, very essential thing for your life, right? So it, it is kind of understandable that when you don't have 
the essential need, it is very, very um, like difficult. It is challenging. I mean, at least for my personal experience, it was very challenging for me to be faithful when I don't have the basic need. Like, how can I be faithful that I don't know if I'm going to have a foot for tomorrow or not? I know that the bill is coming tomorrow, that I have to pay a certain amount, and today I have no money for the bill. Can I still be faithful? That's when I learned that it is easy to have faith when everything is going great. The real test of faith is when you are facing something that only your faith in God will get you through. Do you agree with this? I'm like, if I, what if I have everything? Yeah, I, it, it will be very easy for me to say, praise God, life is good, you know? <laughs> yeah, God it has been blessing me. And, and, and so you need the faith, but the question is, well, can I be still be a good person without faith in God? Because, because, I mean, we see, you know, the secular world, that there are people, they, are, they don't believe in God, they, but they are good people, right? They give a lot of money to the charity, and, and they volunteer their time to, to help, you know, people in, in need. The question is, yeah, can I still be a good person without faith in God? Yes, we can still be a good person without a faith in God. It means that being a Christian is more than just being a good person. Would you agree with me? But then, when we say a good person in, in, in the earthy standard, yes, he's a good person. But what if I apply to the heavenly standard? Let's say I'm a Mr. Basketball here, right? In this village, I'm the Mr. Basketball. But what if I stand right next to Michael Jordan? I'm not good anymore, <laughs> you know? That's how it is if I stand right next to God. Psalm 14, verse 3 says, They have all turned aside. They have together become corrupt. There is none who does good. No, not one. Romans 3, 23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Luke 18, 19, it says, so Jesus said to them, why do you call me good? No one is good, but one that is God. So when I hear things, people saying that why all the bad things are happening to the good people? Have you heard this complaint before? And then the, the, the answer is, well, the good people, but there's no... The good, like, people, you know, in the world. And, and, and but that, that, at the same time, the question is, what do you mean by, by like, no one does good? Because like I said, there are people, non-believers, they're doing good things. What does it mean? When Bible mentions that there is none who does good, it does not imply that individuals are Utterly evil or incapable of performing any moral, uh, morally upright actions. People have the capacity to do good, such as showing kindness, thoughtfulness, giving generous gifts, and assisting the less fortunate. Even an atheist can be a philanthropist. However, no amount of good deeds can change the fact that all people are sinful by nature. That's what it, what it means in the Bible. So that how can we, how can we please God? How can we make, how can I make the, uh, the Michael Jordan to get pleased with my passport skills? <laughs> if you want to uh, apply that like, like hypothetically, it says without faith, it is impossible to please him. So what makes God please? 
It's not my best for skills. It's not something that I can do, but it, it is the faith in God. And now, in chapter 16, the Israelites, they don't have the faith. And is faith, your faith, my faith, essential for us to get a salvation? Is something necessary? It's kind of optional. Ephesians 2, 8, verse, uh, uh, 8 and 9, it says, For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that, not of yourself, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest anyone should boast. Do you understand what this scripture means? So by grace you have been saved. But isn't that enough? I've been saved. What do I need more? It says that the grace, uh, the, 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 your salvation is the gift of God. And let me explain to you how it's been like. So let's say Milton, he's very, very uh, uh, generous guy, hypothetically. And he would give me a ticket. Hey, Ron, I'm going to give you a gift. It's your birthday. I'm going to give you a ticket to the Disneyland. And what if I said, Disneyland doesn't exist? What if I say, well, this is just a paper. What am I going to do with this? What if I said, I'm concerned that they're not going to take this paper. I got to have a faith to believe that the gift that Milton would give me is really going to get me into the Disneyland. Are you following? So the thing is, God can give you all kinds of gifts, but if you don't believe, if you don't have the faith in that, I'm like, should I go all the way, you know, drive all the way to Anaheim? No, actually, this is for the Disney World. So I have to fly to Florida. Oh, no, I don't want to do it. You know, when you got the gift, there's a certain part. Because Milton is not going to drive me or fly, uh, uh, you know, have me fly all the way to Florida. I got to buy the ticket. You know, there's certain things that we got to also do as a response to God's grace. And what is the response in our part? Faith. And Israelites, that now they're having, having these problems here. So verse 4, now God is trying to teach them. Then the Lord said to Moses, Behold, I will rain bread from heaven for you. And the people shall go out and gather a certain quota every day that I may test them whether they will walk in my law or not. And it shall be on the sixth day, sixth day that they shall prepare what they bring in, and it shall be twice as much as they gather daily. So first, I want to uh, focus here every day. Do you believe that God had this, this ability to provide the food for the entire month? Yes or no? But God is not doing that. You got to come out every day to believe that tomorrow there will be a food. Because when I was canvassing, and, 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 and anybody here working on your sales, you know, um, the department, it doesn't matter how much sale you have made until today. Tomorrow, there's no sale guaranteed. You have to start your day with the faith that I'm going to sell another product, right? Same thing. Now God is teaching them. Every day you have to come out, but then you, you know, you take what you need, not extra. And in my personal experience, when I was a student studying in Andrews, I didn't have any job or something, and I needed money for my tuition, my living costs and everything. When I prayed, God provided things for me, but the exact the amount that I needed. And I'm like, what if, why, why don't you give me a little bit more, you know? <laughs> so I can have some kind of like a peace in my heart. But if I needed $500, God gave me $500. Not $550, not $450, $500. 
Verse 6. Then Moses and Aaron said to all the children of Israel, At evening you shall know that the Lord has brought you out of Egypt, out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, for he hears your complaint against the Lord. But what are we that you complain against us? Also Moses said, This shall be sin when the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening, and in the morning bread to the full, for the Lord hears your complaint which you make against him. And what are we? Your complaints are not against us, but against the Lord. So now we see the grace just got kicked in here because they didn't pray. They complained, right? But since it is essential need, God is going to provide it. But then Moses is saying, but why are you complaining to us? Sometimes we want to find somebody to crucify, right? That happens a lot, in, a lot in the political world. They need somebody to be responsible, you know. And sometimes we may do that, like we complain. In verse 9, Then Moses spoke to Aaron, Say to all the congregation of the children of Israel, Come near before the Lord, for he has heard your complaints. He didn't say he heard your prayers. He heard your complaints. Now it came to pass, as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the children of Israel, they, that they looked toward the wilderness, and behold, the glory of the Lord appeared in the cloud, and the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I have heard the complaint of the children of Israel. Speak to them, saying, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall be filled with bread, and you shall know that I am the Lord your God. Should we not be grateful that we serve God who even hear our complainings? Yes or no? Because people say that, you know, the Old Testament God, he's brutal. He's like, he has no mercy and love. No, I see all the mercy and grace here that he even hear your complaints. And it's still fulfills your need. And God is teaching them here, I am the provider. And this whole chapter, it makes me, helps me to be able to see what God wants from me when I'm in need. He wants me to turn to Him and know that He is the ultimate provider. My boss is not my provider. My knowledge, my education are not my provider. But God is the one who provides everything. And that's what God is teaching the Israelites. And in our journey, sometimes like, people wonder why we give to the church. When I give, when we give our tithe and offerings, it is our faith to recognize God as our ultimate provider. Verse 13, so it was that quail came up at evening and covered the camp. And in the morning, it, the dew lay all around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a small round substance, as fine as frost on the ground. So when the children of Israel saw it, they said to one another, what is it? For they did not know what it was. They see something that they've never seen before. And that's how you're going to feel when, when God is working in your life. Personally, you're experiencing, I've never seen this happening in my life. That's what we call miracle in your personal level. But up to this point, they were complaining, complaining. And Moses said to them, This is the bread which the Lord has given you to eat. This is the thing which the Lord has commanded. Let every man gather it according to each one's need, one omer for each person, according to the number of persons that every man take for those who are in his tent. 
What is one omer? How big is that size? One omer is 2.3 liter, 0.67 gallons. And I see God's health message here. Don't overeat. This is the amount that you're going to eat every day. You know, don't collect more, you know. And take what you need. God is teaching them, don't be greedy. Take only what you need. And as Christians, as we go on our own journey of access, sometimes we display our greediness. Sometimes we want more than what we need. So uh, verse 17, Then the children of Israel did so and gathered some more, some less. So when they measured it by omers, he who gathered much had nothing left over, and he who gathered little had no lack. Every man had gathered according to each one's need. And Moses said, Let no one leave any of it till morning. But again, they're not listening. Notwithstanding, they did not heed Moses. But some of them left part of it until morning, and it bred worms and stank. And Moses was angry with them, so they gathered it every morning, every man according to his need. And when the sun became hot, it melted. What does this teach us? Because Moses said, don't leave it. Finish it. Why do you think people have some left over until the next morning? Maybe they were full, or maybe they were kind of lazy. But for me, maybe like, you know what, tomorrow I don't want to go out. Let me, let me just eat the leftover. Are you following? Second thing that you see here, when the sun came out, it's melted. You cannot sleep in until noon. You have to wake up early in the morning and come out and gather the food Why every day? Why every day? Because God wants us to have our connection with Him every single day. When? In the morning. Why every day? Can I have my devotion for four hours for an entire week? And then, and then just, you know, live with that? No, because Satan does not take a break. Satan doesn't take his day off. That's why God says every day before you start your day, you need to take this manna. And we call our daily devotions spiritual manna. I don't know if you heard that uh, phrase. We call it daily manna, daily uh, devotions. We need our daily manna every single day. And verse 22 and, it, and so it was on the sixth day that they gathered twice as much bread to Omer's for each one. And all the rulers of the congregation came and told Moses. Then he said to them, this is what the Lord has said. Tomorrow is a Sabbath rest, a holy Sabbath to the Lord. Bake what you will bake today and boil what you will boil and lay up for yourselves all that remains to be kept until morning. So they laid it up till morning, as Moses commanded. And it did not stink, nor were there any worms in it. Then Moses said, eat that today, for today is what? Sabbath to the Lord. Today you will not find it in the field. Six days you shall gather it, but on the seventh day, the Sabbath, there will be none. And the house of Israel called its name manna, and it was like white coriander seed, and the taste of it was like a wafers made with honey. And now God is teaching them about Sabbath because the Israelites, they forgot about Sabbath. When they were slaves, do you think the Pharaoh gave them a Sabbath off? No, they were working like 24-7 all day, every day. So those hundreds of years, the entire, the Israelites, they forgot about Sabbath. 
So now God is teaching them the importance of the Sabbath. Because six days, you need daily manna, right? So only in the morning, you have your devotions and everything. But for the Sabbath, I need your full day with me. Because the Sabbath is all about our relationship with God. How do we spend our Sabbath? Do we, do we dedicate the whole day to get to know God? Or do we squeeze our time just for the couple hours on Saturday morning? When we had all the other plans in the afternoon and then we just squeeze in. God says, I need the whole day. You may have daily manna for the six days, but for the Sabbath. I want to have a relationship with you. Because on the fourth commandment, and, and this is the only commandment uh, out of the Ten Commandments, God says, remember the Sabbath day. When you remember something, you got to have a relationship. you got to remember your wife's birthday, James. I don't know her birthday because she's not my wife. But you, you got to know her birthday you got to know your anniversaries. I don't know any of your, you know, your anniversary date, but you should know your anniversaries. Why? Because it's a special day for you because the relationship that you have for you, both of you, right? And same thing here. God is saying, this is my anniversary with you. Remember the Sabbath day. So what if on my anniversary, and I talk to my wife, I would say, I can have two hours with you. The rest of the day, I'm going to be busy. Do you think your relationship with your wife will go well? Yes or no? You don't want to know that. But a lot of times we overlook this, that God, that's okay. You know, I gave you two hours. What do you need more? Now God is teaching the Israelites that I want to have a relationship with you. And now verse 27. Now it happened that some of the people, see how people, they don't listen, went out on the seventh day together, but they found none. And the Lord said to Moses, how long do you refuse to keep my commandments and my laws? See, for the Lord has given you the Sabbath Therefore, he gives you on the sixth day bread for two days. Let every man remain in his place. Let no man go out of his place on the seventh day. So the people rested on the seventh day. There were people still went out. Think that they may gather more. But they found none. I mean, today, I can still work whatever days, how many days that I want. I can still make more money. Yes, I can still open my businesses. But without God in your life, why do you think there's so much, so many, so much depression going on today? People will think that the money will give you happiness. They work very hard to achieve a certain amount, goal and everything. But once they achieve the goal, they realize that they, they are not still happy. They're still empty. Your life will never be fulfilled without Jesus, without God. Because he's the one who gives you the ultimate purpose of your life. And without God, no matter how much resources and, and money that you have, you will never feel fulfilled. And that's why Solomon, I would say that he would be the richest person in history. Solomon, after he had everything, and then what did he say? Vanity, vanity, vanity. That's his advice for you and me today. Why? Because he missed the relationship with God when he was accumulating all the wealth for himself. And he realized that everything is vanity. Why we, 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 we're not grateful to God? Because I think sometimes we think that God is like a genie, like an Aladdin's movie, you know? We call out genie when we need him, 
It's like a TV switch. Oh, I need, I need, I need to turn the TV on. So click. God, I need you. And then turn it off. I don't need you right now. God is not genie. I pray, not wish, because I have God, not genie. God is teaching Israelites the consistency, the daily walk with God. God would have given them the whole month of supply, but he didn't do it because that's the only way that they can grow their faith. If you read your Bible 10 minutes, 5 minutes every day, it's a lot better for your relationship with God than you just pick one day and read the Bible 3 hours. Are you following? I mean, when you go to gym, work out, I mean... Hitting the gym 30 minutes a day, it's a lot better than just stay in the gym for four hours and one day a week. Do you agree with me? The same thing. So our spiritual life, this is a journey. The access that you and I are taking to all the way to heaven is a journey. It's a process. So being a Christian is more than just an instantaneous conversion. It is a daily process whereby you grow to be more and more like Jesus Christ. And when you understand this process, your spiritual life will be a lot more meaningful. You appreciate God for small little things that you took it for granted. What about all these things? Waking up to a new day, the warmth of the sun of your face, a good night's sleep, fresh air to breathe, the joy of laughter, finding a parking lot when you need it, the sound of raindrops on the window, the ability to see the beauty of nature, a delicious meal, the gift of good health, the support of friends and family during tough times, a beautiful sunset or sunrise, having access to clean water and food, the ability to pray and find solace in faith, the list can go on and on and on and on. And when you start to have a relationship with God and start to appreciate and being grateful for all the small little things that God has done for you, your spiritual life is going to be a lot more strong and, and, and you're going to be able to now serve the others. You're not the receiver anymore. You're now becoming a contributor. So when we come to church, this is our mindset. Being a Christian is, I'm coming to church to receive. No, we're coming to the church in this community. We're coming here to give, to contribute. Because God has done so much for me. God has given me so much. And now I cannot just hold this, just, just, just within me. I want to share this gospel. I want to serve other people because God did it for me. And you know what? When you do that, God never takes your service for granted. Your service to God, whether it's physical or financial, your, your contribution will change. Many people's life. And when you are in heaven, they will come and tell you, thank you. Thank you for what you did. 